Nikolai Gogol is one of the most talented and also one of the most eccentric Ukrainian authors. One of his peculiarities is that he believed that he was endowed by God with the talent of using satire to provoke change in society. He was on a mission to induce the betterment of society and later in his life when he would struggle to write and when inspiration wouldn't come as easily as it used to, he interpreted that as a sign that God no longer willed him to be the artistic voice of change he was. Gogol died in 1850 after he had lost much of his sanity. He burned his own manuscripts of unpublished work. In this video, we'll be looking at Gogol's short story, The Overcoat. We'll try to analyze the Marxist concept of alienation and Fremdung, and particularly one type of alienation, Gettungsfensen. We'll also look at the overcoat as a garment that epitomizes the idea of commodity fetishism. The overcoat is the story of a clerk called Akaki Akakievich Pashmashkin, who works in an un name department. The narrator explains why it's better not to name the department. If you don't want any trouble, you'd better not criticize any government employees. Every employee thinks of himself as the embodiment of the institution he works in. We know what kind of society that is. Government officials who oppress the people and the people who can't criticize any officials. You have a problem with a police officer and you're accused of disrespecting the institution of law enforcement. So the clerk's department is not disclosed, but his rank is. Ranks are important. Akaki is a low-ranking employee. He's a scribe. He copies piles of text from paper into other paper. His rank is mockingly referred to as an eternal titular counsellor. Gogol spares no effort in sketching a mediocre portrait of Akaki. He's short, wrinkled and quite battered at the hands of time and the inclement weather of St. Petersburg. Akaki is not respected at his workplace. He is insignificant. His superiors don't exchange a single word with him. They have their secretaries stack piles of documents on his desk. Documents that he copies monotonously. Akaki is as immobile as a rock. All he does is sit at a desk and copy words from paper into other paper. This monotony and immobility denotes a persistent stagnation that is contrary to humans' natural tendency towards change. Karl Marx describes how this type of labor alienates workers. Ideally, work should be a creative act when we emotionally and practically connect with whatever we're producing. However, monotonous repetitive work constitutes the antipode of this vision. It is is boring, mechanistic and leads to the alienation of the human. Younger clerks make fun of Akaki and they crack chalks about him. They would tear up paper and sprinkle it over his head. Akaki takes everything in and doesn't respond. He is resigned to a life of belittlement. He doesn't react to any of the slurs he's a target to. The only time he reacts, and quite meekly, is when they harm his physical integrity and his reaction amounts to, let go of me, aren't we all brothers, with a goal of having and his oppressors back off out of pity. Akaki is a model worker though. He loves his job. He loves to copy things into paper. He loves copying so much that he has favorite letters. He's overjoyed every time he sees them while copying. The narrator says that if Akaki's good work were awarded justly, he would be promoted to a state councillor, but it wasn't. And this doesn't anger Akaki. He thrives in the tediousness of his job, he's always shabby, his clothes are dirty, even his dinner is tedious, he always has cabbage soup with some beef and onions. He doesn't distinguish what he eats, it's all food, and this food is sometimes unclean with flies on it, dust and dirt, but none of this matters to Akaki. It's like he's on autopilot, he has no passions, no desires, he's completely resigned, he's like an automaton devoid of any emotions. The day-to-day -day reality of Akaki's life epitomizes Karl Marx's idea of alienation or estrangement. Marx says that stratified societies where there are distinct social classes alienate human beings, and he identifies four types of alienations. The one that Akaki's life clearly epitomizes is a person's alienation from his or her species being or essence. The German word is Gettungsfensen. It is the idea that the psyche of humans is naturally drawn towards a multiplicity of interests. It also seeks to establish connections with fellow humans who all 
all work towards the production of something good, the betterment of a condition. Stratification and hierarchy demolish this natural human tendency. Akaki takes home documents that he copies. Copying documents is Akaki's raison d'etre. It is what he does at work, it is what he does at home after dinner, and it is what he thinks about in his free time. Nothing derails Akaki from his monotonous routine. He goes to work, he copies texts into new pages, he tolerates being the laughing stock of his colleagues, he comes back home, he gulps his dinner, and whenever he has some free time, he salivates about all the copying he'll get to do the following day. It appears Akaki accepts living like an emotionless object. His whole existence is reduced to the professional purpose he serves. He has no aspirations, he has no passions that are outside the task he performs at work. Akaki's comforting habit is unshaken by anything except for one single inconvenience that plagues the lives of all employees whose salaries are around 400 rubles a year, and it is the Northern Frost. A whole class of state employees don't earn enough money to be able to protect themselves against the cold. This is absurd, and it shows how meek the salaries are and how low the quality of life is. Here are people who work for the whole year and they remain unable to afford the bare necessities that the yearly cold season requires. Akaki's coat is tattered beyond repair. Akaki takes it to a tailor with the hope of getting it decently fixed. Petrovich the tailor shocks him by telling him that his coat cannot be salvaged. Akaki has to get a new coat, and that is costly. Akaki stresses over all the money he would need to get a new coat. He decides to reduce his daily expenses. He curtails what he spends on food, on lighting, and he even changes the way he walks to allow his shoes to last longer. On a surface, his quality of life should regress. However, he becomes more alive. Psychologist Viktor Frankl's idea of logotherapy explains what happens to Akaki. He now has meaning. He has a purpose. And it is this purpose that extricates him from his former lethargic stupor. The period of time that Akaki spends trying to save the money for the new coat is the best period of his life. It is the only period in his life where he has a purpose. And positivity continues to flow his way. He gets a 60 rubles bonus at work. The well-timed bonus motivates Akaki to keep pursuing his goal, and he ultimately hits his target. He gathers a decent amount of money, he runs to meet Petrovich, they both parade the streets of St. Petersburg to get the material for the overcoat. Petrovich brings Stu in the price for his service, he makes Akaki a new overcoat that Petrovich himself brings to Akaki's home. The overcoat is great! Akaki wears it to work, and it immediately changes how he is looked at. All his co-workers know notice his new garment. They all compliment him and ask him to throw a party to celebrate the purchase of such a pristine overcoat. All this excites him at first, but then it grows ill at ease, especially at the mention of throwing a party. He starts telling his co-workers that it's not really a new overcoat and that he's had it for some time, until a high-ranking clerk steps in and proposes to host the party at his place. Akaki tries to excuse himself from attending, but all his co-workers don't let him. It is a party to honour his grandiose acquisition after all. Now the overcoat as a clothing article made of cloth and fur that actual workers put efforts to collect and to synthesize. And the overcoat as it is viewed by Akaki, by Petrovich and by all the people at Akaki's workplace evoke Karl Marx's idea of commodity fetishism. Marx says that the commodity functions as a fetish. He's not talking about the sexual fetish. He's referring to the religious fetish. It's like how some pagan tribes would create totems and dolls, but then they would worship them. The doll itself is made of very simple material, branches, rocks, pebbles, and whatever. But once it becomes a totem or a fetish, it becomes something more sanctified than the simplicity of its components. Similarly, commodities are not viewed as the direct objects of the labor of women and men. All that labor is bracketed, and the commodity is fetishized. A khaki's overcoat is a fetish and a powerful fetish that is. It transforms Akaki's life. It frees Akaki from his solitary confinement at work. None of the characters in the novel view the 
overcoat as the product of some workers' labour. Akaki agrees to attend the party that the chief clerk's assistant is to host at his place. It's quite far from where Akaki lives. It's in a posh neighbourhood, unlike Akaki's. He sets off to the party, takes him some time, but he eventually gets there. He hangs his overcoat in the entrance of the apartment as it's customary, and as soon as the guests see him, they greet him enthusiastically and immediately go to the entrance to marvel once again at the sight of the overcoat in a pretty surreal scene that further reinforces the idea of the fetish. Akaki is not accustomed to attending parties, he doesn't know how to mingle. He's cajoled into drinking two glasses of champagne. It relaxes him a little, but is still not comfortable. He decides to leave before the end of the party. He tries to collect his overcoat on the way out and finds it on the ground. This foreshadows the terrible fate awaiting Akaki in his overcoat. The sight of his cherished overcoat on a ground pains him. He picks it up, cleans it, puts it on his shoulders and sits off. Akaki is in a good mood. He strolls back home contemplating a nightlife he's not accustomed to. This time of the night he's usually sleeping in his bed. He passes by a scary neighbourhood and he gets mugged. Two men beat him and take his overcoat. They leave him on the ground. He loses consciousness for a bit. Then he wakes up screaming. He runs towards the police officer who's supposedly patrolling the region. Akaki indignantly accuses the police officer of sleeping on duty. He shouts that he's been attacked and robbed. The police officer tells him that from a fight looks like Akaki's been talking to friends. He tells him to report the crime the following day and that the overcoat should be returned to him. Akaki goes home crestfallen and bruised. He knocks on a door, his landlady opens it and sees the condition he's in. He tells her what has happened. She recommends he go directly to the superintendent and tell him everything. The inspectors at the precinct would only feed them promises without ever honouring them. The following day Akaki goes to see the superintendent but he can't. Meeting the superintendent is such an ordeal. He's either not there or when is there is unavailable. Akaki resorts to a lie to be granted access to the superintendent. He tells the superintendent's assistants that he must see him for some professional matter. They let him in. He tells them what has happened and to Akaki's amazement the superintendent starts treating him like a suspect, inquiring where he's been out that late and whether he's involved in any illegal activity. This is another example of how state institutions despise citizens. Akaki understands that the superintendent won't help him. Akaki is too dejected to go to work. He skips work for one day. That's all he can afford to skip. He goes to work the following day. One of his colleagues advises him to meet somebody referred to as an important person. Again, the narrator is still prudent. He doesn't want to reveal the identity of this important person. All we know is that he is a high-ranking public official. Another thing we know is that the important person has been nice and humane prior to his promotion to his current professional title, after which he has become patronising and scornful. It is the system that transforms normal people into bureaucratic sadists. It is the same idea expressed in situationalism. It is the situation that dictates the type of choices that people go for. Akaki goes to see the important person. The important person is at his office talking to a friend of his. He has Akaki wait outside for no reason before he calls him in. And as soon as Akaki gets into the office, the important person humiliates him for no reason other than to show off and to command some more admiration from his friend. He reprimands Akaki for not following the protocol and condemns a whole new generation of disrespectful ignorant citizens. Akaki is in his 50s. He swallows the humiliation and goes out. After that, he gets sick. The code against which he has no protection gets the best of him and he dies cold, wronged and humiliated. This is the life of Akaki Akakievich. And you would think that his death relieves him from his torments, but it doesn't seem so. His ghost continues to haunt the streets in St. Petersburg, especially around the Kalinkin Bridge, looking for a stolen overcoat. This shows how not not even death can correct the wrong that poor workers incur. Akaki can't have peace even after death. He continues to snatch coats off people's backs. One day, on his way to meet his mistress, the important person is attacked by Akaki's ghost, which takes his coat and traumatizes him to the point of reconsidering his treatment of his subordinates. Towards the end of the story, the narrator tells us about another ghost that loiters the streets of St. Petersburg, and it's not Akaki's. 
This shows that there are many tormented people whose torment is too severe that it continues even after death. Another detail that drives towards the same idea is that after Akaki dies, we're told that he's replaced by somebody whose handwriting is a little different from Akaki's. It's another dancer or an automaton who is destined to endure the same life Akaki has endured with maybe slightly different details. But the humiliation will be the same, the frustration will be the same, and not even even death will bring him peace. Now this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.